right. So, um, for this lecture, we're going to talk about something called PV diagrams. So first, let's look at um, the ideal gas law. Let me write it in this form, or a number of moles. So for any given gas, so for any like, you know, N is a amount of the gas. So, but for any given gas, we've got three variables, pressure, volume, and temperature. And we can't really plot all three variables at the same time. So a PV diagram, that's where we plot pressure as a function of volume. So temperature is kind of hidden here, but these diagrams are extremely useful. It's PV diagrams. And we're gonna look at an example. Um, say we have a cylinder with a movable piston. Again, this thermodynamics, this was a huge motivation. Like a lot of the work done here was, you know, designing steam engines for trains. So that's when they were developing this, when that was a very new idea, like motorized transportation. And so that's what really motivated a lot of this research. So we talk about examples like this a lot. All right, now let's say we have this piston and let's say that the gas is going to expand and go through, let's call this delta Y. All right. So the piston has a cross section area A and let's say the gas expands and goes through this, um, it pushes a piston in amount delta Y. And let's say that it does this, we're going to start out by looking at a simple case. Say it does so at a constant pressure. So the pressure of the gas is constant. Uh, now normally, well I mean, this is certainly a possible thing. But when the gas expands, uh, the pressure would tend to decrease, but we can add heat to it to you know, warm it up. So that would increase the pressure to compensate. So we're going to look at this case where it expands from some initial volume to some final volume. And it's doing so at a constant pressure. So we just get this nice horizontal line here. Uh, now, I'm going to write down our first law of thermodynamics again. So here, forget Q for a moment. Uh, let's just look at the effect of work. Now, the gas is expanding. And so, you know, what... It's doing work. So forget about Q. Say nothing's entering. Uh, although that would not be the case with constant pressure, but just to get the, uh, the convention straight, uh, the gas would be losing energy, which means W is positive. So again, we have that convention. The gas is expanding, that means W is positive. So right off the bat, we know the amount of work done by the gas as a positive number. Now let's figure out how much work is done by the gas. Well, work is just force times distance. Now, let's say F delta Y. Now again, I said work is just force times distance. Uh, that's not basically true. However, uh, because force and displacement really are both vectors, and you have to take that into account. And another complicating factor is that the force is not necessarily constant. You, know, you can have work done by a variable force. Or in this case, we have a fixed cylinder, and the pressure is constant, so the force is going to be constant. So we have a constant force, and there's no direction to worry about. You know, the force is upward, the displacement is upward. So in this case, work is just going to be force times that uh, displacement, the amount that the piston is moving. And I find pressure before as force over area. 
or force is pressure times area. So we have pressure times area times delta Y. And this quantity delta Y, A delta Y, what is that? I'm just gonna write it down and then you know, hopefully it'll be easy to see. That is the change in volume of the gas. So again, the gas initially occupies, let's just say it started out at a height Y above the bottom. So the initial volume is just Y times A. And the final volume would be uh, Y plus delta Y times A. So again, the volume would be from the bottom to the new height of the piston which would be Y plus delta Y. And so if we look at the change in volume, we have YA plus delta YA minus YA, or just delta Y times it. Now again, I think it'd be easier just to look at it like delta V, that would just be like this volume here which is A times delta Y. Okay, so basically what we get in this case for a constant pressure, we get the work done by the gas is just P delta V. And we can put an arrow showing the direction. Now we're going in this direction. So the gas started here and it moved you know, the volume is increasing, so we're moving to the right. Um, to point out, in a diagram like this, if you just put a dot, you know, that gives you the pressure and volume. And if you know the temperature when you're in that dot, so it's like this gives you the state of the gas. Uh, temperature is kind of hidden here. And so, again, the state is changing. We can show, like, what direction it's going. Okay. So, in this case, V is, uh, volume is increasing. Okay, now um, I'm going to draw a line underneath this arrow, and um, we can talk about the area underneath this curve. Now, in this case, our curve is just a straight line segment, but in general, what if we had, I'm going to draw a different PV diagram, what if we had a PV diagram that looked something like this? Uh, well, we can talk about the area underneath a curve you know, for a starting value to a final value where you go just like between the curve, you know, straight line down and like the zero. So, yeah, the area under a curve, we can see that this area, so not this area, we're talking about the area underneath this pressure volume diagram, well this is its constant pressure P, and the thickness of this rectangle is delta V. Just uh, from V initial to V final, this is delta V. And since we just have a rectangle, you know, the area of a rectangle is, you know, height times width. So height is P, the width is delta V. So we see in this case with a constant pressure, uh, the work is represented by the area underneath that curve. Now, what if we went the other direction? Well, the work is going to be the same magnitude. However, in this case, the work would be negative. Okay. Now, we showed that this work is equal to the area under a curve for a particular case where we have a constant pressure. What if the pressure is not constant. Just so here's our pressure, volume. What if uh, we have a something that looks like this? And it turns out the work is still equal to the area underneath this curve. And again, we're going to the right, so that would be a positive work. If we're going to the left, the work is negative. And so this is actually true in general, that the work um, 
is always on a pressure volume diagram, you know, the work is always the area underneath that curve. And um, I said always, I guess I should be a little careful. Always is a dangerous word in physics. Um, if you have a cylinder, and say you take a hammer and just smack the cylinder down very rapidly, uh, that result might not hold up necessarily because the behavior of the gas could be extremely complicated in that case. If you try to cause this like extremely rapid like jerky motion, uh, it can form things like turbulence that, uh, but we're not going to worry about things like that. Just I use the word always, which you should be a little careful about. So, uh, yeah, work is the area underneath the curve. And again, um, if you've ever taken calculus, you get to approximate this by, I mean, this is basically this integration, where you can approximate it by like little rectangles where, uh, yeah, and just integrate it. But so we're just going to state it that, uh, on any PV diagram, the area under the curve is equal to the work. Now, a very important thing, uh, what good is this? So let's say we have a cylinder with a movable piston. And say the gas expands. You know, why do we care? Well, we can push something with that. And that can be useful, certainly. Uh, we could even push a car with that. You could have, uh, you know, this cylinder push something. Now, in a car, we want rotational motion. And this is one of the crankshaft. You have this rod that can go back and forth, and it converts that back and forth motion into rotational motion. Uh, so you could at least partially spin a tire by having this, you know, gas expand. Problem is, there are limits to how far this can expand because... Um, you know, cylinder can only be so big. And so a very important type of process is called a cyclic process. Now I'm going to draw an example of a cyclic process on a PV diagram. Maybe not the most realistic process, but uh, it illustrates the concept. And it's not entirely unrealistic. Most of it is in any ways, but... So let's say we go, now what a cyclic process means, means like say we start at point A and we have to end up back at point A. That would be one cycle. And the advantage of that, remember like the volume is going to be the same once you reach point A again. So you get back to your starting conditions and the piston's back where it initially started and then you can repeat the cycle and just go over and over again. So this is an example of a cyclic process. And how much work would be done in this process? Well, let's go from A to B. I'll draw this separately. Going from A to B, the work done would be the area of this rectangle going like all the way to the bottom. Now, how about the work going from B to C? I'll write it like this. Work from B to C, that's going to be zero. And there's two ways you can see that. One is, what's the area underneath a vertical line? That's zero. It has no thickness, so the area is zero. Another way, the volume doesn't change. And so the gas isn't changing its volume. It can't really be pushing on anything and doing work on it. And so, um, yeah, the work along these vertical lines are zero. Now, the work from C to D, is going to be this part here. However, it's negative. So the net effect, like, uh, and then back from D back to A, the work is zero. So we have positive work along segment A to B, which is this entire rectangle, including this piece here. And then from C to D, we have this piece, but it's negative. So the net result is the work is equal to the area enclosed by the cyclic 
process. So a cyclic process has to return to its starting point, so it's going to enclose an area. And again, this is true regardless of the shape. So let me draw another PV diagram. Say so we have a process that looks something like this. The work done would be just whatever area is enclosed by that process, by that you know, curve drawn on the PV diagram. Now, also, we can tell the work here is positive. Because from A to B, that's positive. C to D is negative. But obviously, this area is a lot bigger than this, just this area underneath. And so if you're going clockwise, that would be positive work. If your process is going counterclockwise, then the work would be negative. Okay, so some of the basics about uh, PV diagrams and how they relate to work. It's one reason why PV diagrams are so useful. Uh, we can kind of visualize the work done during this process from a PV diagram. Now, um, I want to look at a couple kind of special processes. Um, we have like a cylinder, and you know, I kind of mentioned one. Say we have a process occurring at a constant pressure, like the cylinder is expanding at a constant pressure. There's actually kind of four special processes we want to talk about. Um, so the first one, is an isobaric process. Uh, we already did talk about that. That is constant pressure. So any pr process that occurs at constant pressure is isobaric. Now this one, um, I'm gonna look up the spelling on this. I don't know if there's an L in that or not. Um, Iso. Coric. So, no, there's no L. Uh, I'm not sure if it's choric or choric. Uh, so, isochoric process, this occurs at a constant volume. So, again, let's say we have our PV diagram here. So, let's actually leave this off. Uh, I don't want to draw this yet. Or right, maybe I'll start. Okay. So say we have this. This would be isobaric. And I want to skip is isochoric for a moment. That would be a vertical line, though. Constant volume. So the volume would be the same, so that would be a vertical line. I don't want to draw that yet, though. I want to draw the next one, isothermal. Now, the name might be hint, like Barrick. Uh, might have heard that term, like a barometer measures pressure. Um, pressure can be measured in units called bars. So, like this ISO means constant, and then Barrick pressure, so constant pressure. I have no idea what coric is, but I guess it means volume. Never heard that before. Constant volume. Thermal, obviously, refers to temperature. So this would be a process that occurs at a constant temperature. Now, what would this look like? Let's say we have, you know, gas expanding. And it's doing so at a constant temperature. Uh, what's that going to look like? Now, I'm going to draw it. This would be an isothermal process. It's going to look something like that. Actually, let's, let's go back to the ideal gas law for a moment. Okay, so N is the amount of gas measured in moles. Let's say we have an isothermal process. N is constant, R is constant, T is constant. What that means is pressure times volume would be constant. And um, again, we're familiar 
with this equation. You might be more familiar in an algebra class. Uh, you would look at the equation this way, y equals 1 over x. Basically, that's what we have. You can write that also. You can write that as x times y equals 1. That's what we have here. Like, that's our x-coordinate, that's our y-coordinate, that's equal to a constant. But the idea is when the volume increases, the pressure decreases. Or if the volume decreases, the pressure increases. We know exactly what this curve looks like. Um, well, it's called a hyperbola. You know, a mathematical shape of it. And so it's going to look something like this. And then let's say we have real small here, an isochoric. I hope that's visible on the screen. But, uh, yeah, so isobaric is a horizontal line. Isothermal is this curved section. It's a hyperbola. You want to know the mathematical shape of it. And then isochoric is uh, just a vertical line. So we're showing three of our main processes on a PV diagram. There's actually one more process, kind of special one, and that's called adiabatic. And that's different. This one means no heat exchange. Now, typically, that would happen if C has something that occurs very rapidly, where heat might take a little time for it to, uh, to actually go from one place to another. So one way this could happen, just an extremely rapid process, uh, that could be an example of an adiabatic process. Now, for isothermal, we have P times V is a constant. We're going to see later... I'm not going to uh, explain this anymore now, but uh, for an adiabatic process, you have PV to the gamma. And again, we, have, we don't even know what gamma is yet, but we'll talk about that later. But again, just to kind of get an idea of what it would look like, gamma is a number greater than 1. So what it would look like on a PV diagram, it would be like a more, it kind of looks like an isothermal, just like steeper. So here, let's say this is an adiabatic. We can make this a cyclic process, say another isobaric process, and then an adiabatic process, so we're back where we started. So again, these two might look the same, just think this one is steeper than that one. And again, we'll talk more about what gamma is later on, but right now I just want you to get some idea of what an adiabatic process would look like on a PV diagram. Okay, now... Um, I'm going to make a table, so I'm going to erase this, I'll kind of rewrite some of it though. I want to look at these four processes, um, start out with isobaric, isochoric, isothermal, and adiabatic. And we want to talk about the work done for each of these processes. So, I don't really need that anymore. Let's look at a nice old bear. Okay. So an isobaric process, um, we'll draw a PV diagram here. So again, that's a constant pressure. So we just get this horizontal line. And uh, we already talked about this. We already know this. Uh, work is equal to P delta V. It's just a rectangle. So delta V 
is this change in volume, constant pressure, we just have a simple rectangle. Okay, now isochoric, this one is very easy. Work equals zero. Now, isothermal is going to be a little more difficult. Um, I guess by a little more difficult, uh, basically I've been trying for the last decade to come up with a way to do this. But we want the area underneath that curve from, like, say, some initial volume to some final volume. So we want to find a way to find this, uh, and we know how they're related. Let's just say PV is equal to constant. So this, we know the exact shape of this. P equals, say, C over V, where C is a known constant. So basically it's like Y equals 1 over X. But how do we find the area underneath this curve? And yeah, I've literally spent a decade trying to figure out how to do this in an algebra-based class. And I have to figure out a way to actually come up with the answer in an algebra-based class and do it in a way that actually has some meaning where you can follow it and you know it doesn't take an hour to go over. And I've never been able to figure out how to do this. Uh, this is like a very trivial problem if you've taken calculus. Uh, like, that's one of the classic problems in calculus, just finding the area underneath a curve. It's kind of like one of the reasons calculus was invented, to do things like that. Uh, but in algebra class, yeah, it's just, I just have to tell you what the answer is. So I don't like doing that, but I have no choice yet. I'm hoping to someday figure out a way, but the problem is, the reason it's so complicated is because the answer involves this natural logarithm. So it's like nRT times the natural logarithm of V final over V initial. So again, uh, just accept it, basically. I cannot prove that in this class. But uh, just trust me on that, or if you don't trust me, you know, trust the book. It's in there. So, yeah. Uh, most cases, we just have no choice on this one. Okay, and then finally an adiabatic one. Now, this one is actually uh, not so bad. Uh, well, it kind of depends on the what type of gas we have. So again, the reason I say this one is not so bad, adiabatic means there's no heat exchange so for an adiabatic process, Q equals zero. And then from the first law, delta U equals Q minus W. So we can say right off the bat that W equals minus the change in internal energy. Now the problem is the internal energy depends on what type of gas. So remember U is... three halves nRT for a monatomic gas and five halves nRT for a diatomic gas. And again, this is at like normal room temperature. If it was very cold, this diatomic gas would act more like a monatomic gas. It would go to three halves. And if it was very hot, then it would be seven halves because you can get these like oscillations in the molecules as well. But uh, yeah, in this class, we're just gonna state this as a true fact. Uh, we're only gonna deal with problems where we're in that temperature range where this is, this is always gonna be true in our class. And uh, don't do you, the only variable here is, is T. So let's say we have a monatomic gas. That would be minus three halves and our delta T. So again, I'll actually show that this would be for a monatomic gas. Yes. 
So I'll show that once. Uh, this delta occurs a lot. So let's say u is 3 halves and rt. And again, this delta thing where we only have one variable, that comes up frequently. But I'll, I'll do it once, and then we'll see kind of a shorthand way of doing it. But let's say we take delta u. That would be u final minus u initial. So we'd have 3 halves nrt final minus 3 halves nrt initial. And we can factor out the 3 halves and r. And we have t final minus t initial. And so this is 3 halves nr delta t, which is what we wrote down here. Again, if it was a diatomic gas, that would be 5 halves. So, um, yeah, so again, we could show like these, this one, and this one, this one. You just kind of have to trust me on that. Now, again, these four processes, though, you should get to know them. Like, you should recognize the names and what they mean. And this here is actually, here, this is on the equation sheet. And also that table, let me find the equation sheet just to uh, double check. I don't want to lie to you. Yeah, this equation sheet is posted online. But, for example, we have... Uh, like right here, internal energy, you know, three halves from atomic. So you've got that. And up here, like work done by an expanding gas. Uh, for an adiabatic, work is minus delta U. So you can put those two together. So like this is on the equation sheet. All of these are. Um, well, okay, not this one because you don't need that. But, um, yeah, like basically this table is on the equation sheet and also that uh, the internal energy of a monatomic and a diatomic gas so you can get that as well and again we're able to show all of this except for the isothermal but again these are all very important processes and um, yeah i think that'll be it for these pv diagrams we'll be using them in the future so we just covered the basics today of a PV diagram and how that relates to work. Uh, we talked about cyclic processes. And then, um, you know, these four special processes. Uh, so definitely kind of learn what those things actually are. So if you hear like isothermal, you should just know without looking it up that that means constant temperature. Okay, so uh, yeah, that'll be it for this one.